I have a stomach bug, but I'm tired of laying in bed. So let's talk about Harry Potter. I, today, just a little bit ago while I was lying in bed, being miserable, finished Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. So now let's talk about it. Harry Potter is the third book and it is also the book where things actually start really getting intricate. The first two books were pretty straightforward plots. We've talked about this in my other reviews, but they were a lot more characters accomplish these list of tasks that lead them to their end result. It feels like it feels like the school is orchestrated to drive Harry Potter and crew toward whatever it is that they're doing in that book. But book three is the first one that really is a lot more intricate, a lot less straightforward. There's a lot more twists to it, which I mean, there are twists in the first two as well, but it feels more complex and less like this is what we've been building up to this whole time. Personally, I don't tend to be a fan of time travel in books because I don't, it just, it doesn't work. There's always holes. There's always things that don't make sense because time travel doesn't make sense. And magic doesn't work either because magic, you know, it's not real either. But somehow time travel trips me up a lot more. So because of that, book three has never been my favorite, even though I know it's a lot of people's favorites. However, reading this book has been awesome because the stakes are raised, the depth to a lot of side characters introduced that have so much depth and complexity to them. And just overall, this entire book feels like it really stepped up its game and it really just feels like everything was taken up an extra notch or two in this book. And um, I definitely don't dislike this book. I hope that's not how that last comment sounded. Um, I love this book and I love that it feels like this is the book where things start really getting real. So we kick off the book with more child abuse, um, which is a theme throughout the series because the Dursleys are horrible. We get to see a lot more of isolation and hatred, uh, verbal abuse, as well as some physical abuse. But once again, taken up a little bit, a little bit more when Aunt Marge comes for a visit. Boy, does she suck. Um, and I feel like as horrible as Aunt Marge is, the Dursleys really, their sliminess is so much worse to me in this book because Marge, as horrible of a human she is, as far as we know, she's not a mom. The Dursleys actually had a kid and now they're raising Harry, not really their choice. But Marge, she's horrible and she talks about how, um, she talks about how if there's something wrong with the mother of the litter, then there's going to be something wrong with the pup, talking about dog breeding, she's a dog breeder. And when you get a runt, when you get one that just has bad bloodlines, that's just, you can tell from the pup that it's gonna suck, the best thing you can do is just drown it. And she's talking about Harry as she gives this illustration. She goes on to talk about how horrible Harry's parents are. She thinks that he should be beaten more often and they need to write to the school and, and give permission to beat him more thoroughly because he shouldn't be talking about his beating so easily. Just overall, she's horrible. But the Dursleys this entire time are so anxious. Partially they're anxious because they don't want Harry to let slip that he's a wizard, but also they're anxious because they want him to make it seem like he's more abused than he already is. They want to amp up their horribleness to impress or satisfy their family member that happens to be even more horrible than them. The fact that they're already an abusive family to him, and then they try to make themselves look even worse for the sake of saving face, they want to be worse to him, is horrifying. Then we have the night bus. Boy, do I love the night bus, and I'm not entirely sure why. Well, yes I am, because it's cool. But also, why does it exist? I love the night bus because of its nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. It's a triple-decker bu bus driven by a man who has no idea how to drive it. Everything, including buildings, are jumping out of the way of the bus as Ern flies through the streets with no control over it. The beds are not nailed down, screwed down, and fly all about as you're trying to sleep in this loud, chaotic bus. Harry pays for hot chocolate and then has it spilled on his bed and he's not reimbursed and the bed isn't cleaned up. He's just expected to deal with it. And he didn't even spill it. Stanley did, but also why does the night bus exist? Or if it does, how are there other passengers on there? I don't feel like the market for this is very strong. And it took Harry all night to get to his destination because he had to wait for the other wizards to get to their destination first. Yet we have brooms, flu powder, 
apparition, side-by-side -side apparition, I think is what it's called, when somebody who knows how to apparate just takes you along with them. Oh, and port keys, we have port keys as well. We have magical creatures and inanimate objects that are capable of flying. We have so many options for flight. I can't imagine the market for the night bus is very strong. We have underage wizards who don't have wizards that are of age around that can assist them in traveling. And then we have maybe old people that don't like all the other also uncomfortable means. Man, traveling as, as a witch or wizard is very uncomfortable. Pretty much every form of travel that's been described has been very unpleasant. But those muggles in their cars, am I right? But anyway, the night bus seems like one of the least convenient forms of travel, so it's honestly shocking to me that so many people are on it. Granted, everybody on the night bus while Harry is there, at least everybody that's mentioned, is either elderly or underage, so I guess they have a demographic, but it's just surprising to me that there would be enough people that Harry would have to wait that long to get to his destination. Then we get on to the Hogwarts Express, and who? Um, this was an interesting one. We have Dementors that come onto the bus to suck your soul out of you. That's not true, they're looking for black and they don't try to kiss anybody, but they do inhale their breath and suck all the happiness out, even though these are not prisoners, these are not convicts, there's no reason for the Dementors to be trying to steal happiness from all of these children. And the one Dementor won't even leave until Lupin Tells, does he do a Patronus? Can't remember what Lupin does. Harry passes out, we know that much. But anyway, they're lingering, trying to suck all the happiness out of these children. These are truly evil creatures. Not only do they delight in stealing joy from everyone around them, and also like to suck souls out of people, not really caring if they're innocent or not, but also they go to do a routine inspection and try to suck all the happiness out of the children just for funsies. But let's put them on the Hogwarts grounds. Surely nothing can go wrong. After all, this is the safest place on earth. Anyway, Harry passes out because he has some trauma and all the sadness causes, it affects him more. But something that I noticed this time around is that it does the same to Ginny. For some reason, this has always gone over my head, but Ginny experiences the same thing as Harry. It says that she looks as bad as Harry felt. And then later they also talk about how she was like rocking and shaking the whole time the Dementors were there. And Ginny, one book ago, was possessed by Lord Voldemort and did some pretty horrible things. She also has some serious trauma in her life, and so these creatures that are horrible affect her too, just like Harry. I really appreciate that consistency. I, I appreciate that little touch. I also think it's very interesting. This isn't book canon, so I'm kind of going off topic. I try to keep book canon here in these videos. I don't want to go into Pottermore and Rowling's tweets and all that because then we get into a cluster cuss. But I do find it interesting that Rowling based the Dementors on depression. The fact that they suck happiness out of you, that they feed on happiness, that that's how they function as they try to take every happy memory from you, leaving you with only the the horrible memories, which is how Black was able to get out of Azkaban is because he was thinking Pettigrew is in Hogwarts and that wasn't necessarily a happy memory, so they couldn't take it from him, but it was something that kept him going. So I find it interesting that their purpose is to suck all the happiness from you, that people, when they encounter a Dementor, they always say the same thing. It feels as if I'll never be happy again. And I also think it's just a really funny touch that the thing that helps you the most after you've had an encounter with a Dementor is a lot of chocolate. She based the Dementors off of depression, describes it in a really accurate way, and then, says chocolate makes you feel better. I just think that's a really great touch. Speaking about all this Dementor stuff on the, on the uh, Hogwarts Express, let's talk about Lupin. Lupin is one of the best characters in the Harry Potter series. I know that there are some mixed opinions out there, but I feel like for the majority, a lot of us love Lupin. He is so sweet and thoughtful and kind to his students. He really takes Harry under his wing, and obviously there's a reason for that with his love for Harry's dad and their long, lasting friendship before his dad passed away. But also, the, there are so many things that endeared me to Lupin in this read. Uh, one of the things is how tattered Lupin is. They talk about how he has such tattered robes, about how his robes look even more tattered and pitiful next to all the other teachers when he's sitting at the teacher's table, all their new robes and his that are just clearly old and battered. And then after they've been at Hogwarts, when they have their first class with Lupin, Harry notices that he looks still very disheveled, but also that he looks a little bit better as if he's had a couple of square meals, 
which is so sad. Lupin also talks about how he's never been able to have a paid job because he's a werewolf and no one will hire him. So Lupin is living on nothing, essentially. He's scraping to get by in the most literal sense because of this prejudice towards werewolves that he has nothing, can, he has nothing, no way to control. It's not something he chose. And it's truly sad. It's a really sad position he's in. The other thing that stood out to me about Lupin is his, his regret over his past and his humility over Snape's grudge. So Snape has a grudge. It's a fair thing to be mad about. Um, Sirius told uh, Snape when they were kids, when they were 16 years old in school together, Sirius told Snape that um, there's this knot in the tree that makes the tree stop moving and then you could see what's inside, go have a look-see. And then he legitimately wants Lupin to get a hold of Snape. He tries to kill him, which is horrifying, especially when you think about the fact that he tries to kill him at the unwilling hands of his friend. Lupin doesn't want to be a werewolf. He doesn't want to attack people. He doesn't want to hurt anyone. So Sirius sends Snape into the place where Lupin is hiding to stay away from people so that Lupin will kill him. And then Lupin is gonna have to live with that? It's a really messed up thing that Sirius did. And then when James realizes what his best friend did, he grabs a hold of, he goes after Sirius, oh golly, these names. He goes after Snape, grabs him, drags him out before Lupin can kill him, but Lupin, but he, Snape does catch a glimpse of Lupin and finally knows what's been going on with the boys all this time while Lupin is uh, having to be a werewolf once a month. And Snape is understandably pretty mad about the situation. I understand the grudge he's holding. I appreciate that despite the grudge, he's still making the potion for Lupin, probably only because Dumbledore tells him to, but still I appreciate that he's doing it and that he doesn't actively try to, to poison Lupin. But Lupin has so much regret over that. And he, it's not his fault. He can't have done anything to prevent this event. And yet he has so much compassion for Snape's situation and really regrets what they put him through, regrets how passive he was as a kid. He talks about how the group wasn't kind to Severus and he just stood back because he was too passive, too intimidated, too scared to really do anything about it. And he regrets that so much. He regrets the fact that he didn't stand up to his friends more. And so when Snape is openly cruel to Lupin and mocks him and is horrible to him because of what Snape went through, Snape is still taking it out on Lupin when Snape um, spends an entire class trying to unveil to the students passively that, hey, he's a werewolf, study werewolves, try to catch up on the signs. And when Lupin realizes that Snape did that, he just kind of smiles and shrugs it off and he's like, no worries guys, you don't have to do the homework. He's just so humble about it all because he's compassionate and understanding of why Snape is in this hatred, this position of hatred toward him. And I think his regrets for his passivity as a kid, as well as his humility toward Snape's grudge is beautiful. I know I just spent a really long time on Lupin alone, but honestly, his character really impressed me in this book. I feel like I got to know him on a level that I've not gotten to know him on any of my other rereads. And I, Lupin is such a beautiful character. He made mistakes as a kid by letting his friends do horrible things, but he has learned from them, has regrets from them, and is a better person, is, is, is acting better because he knows what he did wrong and, want, and doesn't want to continue to be that person. I just, <sighs> Lupin's amazing. Hagrid is another character that is just so sweet in this book. He gets the job and he's absolutely giddy about it. He's so excited to be a teacher. He's so excited to have this opportunity. He was screwed when he was in third year, kicked out of school, had his wand snapped for being falsely accused. And even when his name was cleared, he's still not allowed to have a wand or magic anymore, which I straight up don't understand because Ron got his wand replaced. Why can't Hagrid, Hagrid has, have his replaced? He's still living as if he, did the thing that everyone knows he didn't do, which is super unfair. But he's so excited to be a part of the school, to be a teacher, and he's so sweet. And he just bit off a bit more than he could chew. And because Draco is literally the worst person ever, 
everything comes crashing down. And the roller coaster of emotions that Hagrid experiences through this book of such excitement and then disappointment and then fear and then the pain of knowing that the hippogriff that Buckbeak is going to be executed and then the joy when he gets free. It just, <sighs> Hagrid is such a beautiful, sweet character. Serious, let's talk about him a little bit. Boy's dark. We already talked about what he did when he was 16, but also as an adult, he's pretty, um, don't get me wrong, I love Sirius, but also in this reread, I was like, whoa, Sirius. First of all, he grabs Harry by the neck and starts choking him and doesn't stop until Hermione kicks him and makes him let go. How far were you gonna take that man? I don't think he was gonna kill Harry, but also what is happening right now? He's also a little bit loopy, which, you know, is understandable, he's been through a lot in Azkaban. But the man will not just stop to think. He's got Pettigrew in his grasp and he's like, I'ma kill him. I don't care that all the kids think I'm trying to kill them. I don't care that I sound like an absolute nutter while I'm screaming, I want to commit the murder I was convicted for 12 years ago. He doesn't care how he sounds. He doesn't care that all the children are terrified and think that he's going to kill them. He doesn't care about anything. He doesn't care about explaining anything. He's like, let me kill the rat and then we'll see what happens next. And then after the rat is, well, after Peter is, you know, exposed and we've had a really, really, really long monologue about how we all got to where we are, then finally, um, he just kind of flips a switch and suddenly he's not aggressive and insane. And he's just like, hey, come live with me. I really like you, Harry. And Harry's like, well, I was going to kill you with my bare hands two minutes ago, but yes. I'm making light of that, but also the fact that Harry says yes so quickly in this kind of situation where he literally was going to kill him with his bare hands two minutes ago. And then the first kind thing that Sirius says to him is, would you like to live with me? And Harry throws everything out the window. You just tried to choke me. I just tried to kill you. And he's like, I can get away from the Dursleys. Now we as readers know a lot more about Sirius now than we did when we were first reading book three. We've read the other books. So we know that Sirius is actually a really cool guy but he's not that cool in book three. In book three, he's pretty much insane except for that one moment where he's sweet and wants to take Harry in and is good to loop it and everything. And then, and then he almost dies. And actually, and then that last scene at the end was beautiful. But the fact that after everything that just happened, Harry is excited, so excited to go and live with Sirius is a real testament to what he's excited to get away from. I have a lot more I wanna talk about, but man, I've been talking for a long time already. Do I skip the other things? Do I go through them really fast? Let's do a lot of fast mentionings. <laughs> the whole blow up between Hermione and the boys, um, I had so much compassion for Hermione, obviously, like you're supposed to because the boys stopped talking to her. Um, but also I kind of feel like she's at fault too here. I mean, why did she bring Crookshanks into the boys' room on Christmas day? This isn't at the point where the rat goes missing, but there are multiple instances where Hermione goes into their territory where she doesn't belong, like their bedroom and brings the cat, and then the cat jumps on Scabbers and attacks him, and, and then Ron gets mad. And I'm like, well, yeah, he's mad. Why'd you bring the cat? You know the cat is after the rat. Why'd you do it? So there are several si situations where it's like, Hermione, you're smarter than this. Just why are you putting more tension into the relationship? Then you have the fact that Hermione is a proper tattletale in this book, and I love her for it because it shows so much strength, like when the Firebolt is, um, gifted to Harry on Christmas and Hermione says, I, you can't be using that. What if Sirius sent it to you? This could be a trick. And then she goes off and tells McGonagall the firebolt is taken away. That's why they stopped talking to her. And then she does something else too. She tells on them about something else too, but I can't remember in between the other, in, in between the first and the last thing. And then in the end, after they're super not talking to her because she's repeatedly telling them not to do things or she's going to tell on them, she then walks up on Harry saying that he's going to go into Hogsmeade again for a second time. And she says, if you do, I'll tell someone. And she's not even part of the conversation. It's like, Hermione, sweetie, I love that you care more about your friends than about your good standing with them. Like she chose to throw her friendship with them to the wolves when she 
got that firebolt taken away from Harry. She knew what was gonna happen. She knew they'd be mad, but she was in the right. She was looking after them. She was genuinely trying to make sure that Harry would be safe in a situation where he wasn't thinking right. And I'm pretty sure the second situation where she tattles on them, it's the same thing, where she's genuinely showing bravery by being a tattletale because she's trying to save them when they're being dumb. But then that third time when she's just like, I'm going to tell if you go to Honeydukes again, it's like, Hermione, stop. <laughs> At some point, you just got to, you got to stop leaning into it so much. I also really hate that it took the boys apologizing first because really Hermione's cat killed the rat. I mean, he didn't, but there's no reason for them to think that Crookshanks didn't kill Scabbers. But she refuses to acknowledge it. She keeps saying, no, Crookshanks didn't do it, and no, whatever. And she she keeps arguing with them about it and stamping her foot and holding her ground. And there's no reason to do it. She won't apologize. She won't say, at least, I'm sorry, your rat is dead, Ron. Like, no compassion. She's like, I'm in the right here. And in this situation, she's not. In this situation, it's just a sad thing. Hagrid put it the best when he was like, the cat did what cats do. You guys just need to acknowledge that and move forward and be better friends than you're being. But it took Ron mending the bridge for her to finally say, I'm sorry about what happened. Good job being brief. I also felt really bad for Neville because he got humiliated, shamed, and very punished for um, Sirius Black getting a hold of his his uh, list of, of passwords because he dropped them somewhere. Sweet boy, no he didn't. Crookshanks took them from Neville's bedside table and gave them to Sirius Black. Neville didn't do anything wrong, but once again, the poor kid is ostracized and oh, I feel so bad for him. Harry Potter in this book leaves his cloak everywhere and in the books previous, the kid doesn't have any value for this invisibility cloak. He continually just leaves it places. He left it in the astronomy tower in book one. He left it in the witch's hump back, which was a little bit more reasonable. And then he just left it outside on the ground when he went chasing after Ron. Why? 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 Why not just bring it with you? You shove it in your pocket all the time. You apparently have magically huge pockets. Why not shove it in your pocket this time too? Once again, Harry Potter likes to just chuck valuable things aside in the face of danger. Slytherin should not have even played that final Quidditch match. When Malfoy, Crab, Goyle, and Flint all acted like Dementors and tried to sabotage Harry's match against Ravenclaw, that should have disqualified them. When they were trying to sabotage the match, sabotage the opponents so that they would have better chances of winning, that should have disqualified them from the Quidditch Cup right then and there. Why were they allowed to play? And then they played so dirty and still there were no consequences. They just, they, they kept playing, they kept playing dirty. They kept breaking the rules. Madame Hooch would just yell a little bit and then they keep playing. I tell you, Quidditch is like the most brutal game in the world. Okay, and then the last thing that I wanted to mention was just acknowledging how short that, that sequence with the time turner is. I do remember in the movies, I haven't seen the movies in a really long time, so I've forgotten most of the things in them, but I do remember in the movies, there were a lot of little things like throwing a rock at someone's head probably at some point and Hermione howled to get the werewolf to come. There was a lot more stuff going on in the movies that made their journey back just a, a lot more fun. But in the book, it's about 40 pages long. About the last, no, not even 40. It starts in the last 40 pages of the book, but then there's the whole ending of the book. So it's really like 20, 25 pages of the book where they go back in time and undo or change everything. And that's such a small portion of the book. And it's really boring. Like they go into the woods for a while, they wait. They go into the hut for a while, they wait. It's just, it, there's not a lot happening except for like the few big things that happen. And it doesn't feel disproportionate still. It's pretty impressive. JK Rowling oftentimes just doesn't dedicate very much time to her endings of her books. And yet I still feel pretty good about them most of the time. Anyway, this review has been way too long. I still need to do the it doesn't make sense video and I don't feel good. So usually my reviews go off, go up on off days, but I didn't do it this time. So here we are, here it is. But tomorrow is going to be the, uh, the second video we're gonna dig into all the little things that didn't quite line up just right. I love this book. It was so much fun. These characters are incredible. I would love to keep chatting with you about it in the comments. I post videos every Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. I'll see you guys again soon. Bye.